Welcome everyone to our first fall 2022 faculty professional development lecture, uh, the role of distance learning in higher education. We hope you'll all join us for the second lecture, exemplary classes at CCS with Aki Chukla and Russell Jones on Friday, October 28th. Today's speakers are David Gadzowicz and Ashley Watson. So to start, uh, David is the current chair and associate professor of the Entertainment Arts Department. He has an MFA from Eastern Michigan University and a BFA from CCS, one of our own. Uh, David is also an independent animator, filmmaker, audio producer, game interaction designer. He still keeps up uh, with an active freelance practice while teaching full-time um, and has worked on projects ranging from broadcast documentaries for the Michigan Opera Theater, live event production for Crane Communications, broadcast television spots for Detroit Opera House, Michigan Opera Theater, and Oakwood Common. David has had video and animation work exhibited at noted festivals such as the Ann Arbor Film Festival and Media, Film, sorry, Media City Film Festival in Windsor, Ontario, among others. And then we have Ashley, Ashley Watson, uh, who currently serves as the Director of Academic Planning and Effectiveness at CCS. She earned her BA from Eastern Michigan University in English Language and Literature Letters, and she has an MS in Management and Leadership from Western Governors University. This past June, Ashley was awarded the 2022-2023 Emerging Leader Award by the Society for College and University Planning. Through the lens of data-informed decision-making, Ashley develops and implements continuous improvement initiatives for the academic division, research, and present industry trends, assists with planning and decision-making, and manages accreditation efforts. Ashley's goal is to be a part of a re-envisioning of the country's higher education and workforce development system, creating opportunities for every individual to have equitable access to education and skill growth that will improve their personal and professional circumstances. I am pleased to announce David Gazdowitz as our first speaker. Thank you so much, Brooke. I'm really excited to be here and uh, really excited to kind of talk on this, uh, this topic of distance learning and online learning. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, so hopefully everybody can see my screen here. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, my experiences with online learning and online education and some of the potential that I that I see. Um, so um, I just wanted to kind of give people a, a quick background and who I am and, and what I do and kind of where I'm coming from. So um, as Brooke mentioned, I'm the uh, chair of entertainment arts um, as well as the MFA and MA motion design chair. So we're working to get that, uh, that platform, that program running uh, currently within the graduate department. Um, my background, uh, so I've been teaching since 2005. Uh, so really, uh, I, I sort of fell into teaching and I, I became really excited about the opportunities that are provided. Um, and I really stuck with it since 2005. So I'm, I'm still uh, still kind of kicking around the uh, kicking around CCS. Um, I've been working in the field of video editing and production since 2005 as well, actually a little bit before that uh, with uh, working at uh, some internships and some freelance experience, but uh, primarily, uh, some of my first full-time gigs working at uh, production studios and post houses really started around 2005 as well. So um, I also worked for three years uh, as the online media production manager at Wayne County Community College within the distance learning division there. So my primary role uh, was to help um, teachers who were working in the distance learning division teaching primarily completely online classes. I helped them produce media uh, that could be used uh, within their courses and also looked at new technologies and, uh, and, and things that could, be, that could be used for an online education. Uh, that was actually in 2008, so that's, that's quite a while ago, but uh, a lot of the same ideas and uh, technologies that were being used then are still in place now. They've just been enhanced quite a bit. And then lastly, I jumped into the online instruction out of necessity, as I'm sure a lot of us did. Uh, as soon as the pandemic hit, uh, we were all kind of uh, asked to pivot in, in, 
and had to in order to continue uh, teaching as we needed to throughout that, that time. So it was really sort of one of those situations where as we um, we did make that pivot, we had to, we had to think quickly in, in order to actually be successful in what we were doing. Uh, so I became the chair of EA about a year and a half ago. Um, so I'm also, as I mentioned, I'm working with the graduate department um, and EdTech. I want to give a shout out to EdTech. I saw Gretchen here um, to develop the MA Online Motion Design Program here at CCS. Um, and EdTech has been amazing so far as we've been going through in like the early phases of, of transitioning to online courses uh, there. So um, uh, excellent, excellent experience so far. And then my experience at Wayne County Community College really gave me a lot of insight into online teaching environments, as well as the instructors that were working in that area. Because it, it does take a certain type of instructor at times to really successfully launch an online course. So what have I learned really during that time? So all of my experiences kind of led me to these, these topics. So I've learned that different modes of learning work for different learners, obviously. I think we all know that, but it's it's really something that, that dawned on me. And I'm like, we have to be able to, to pivot, to shift, to be um, willing to be flexible, uh, depending on the learners that we're really kind of trying to target. Students need simplicity and consistency within a course, especially within course design and, and when they're trying to track down info. Uh, learners will gravitate to what they know and use. There are a ton of tools that help with alternative learning methods. So just outside of the physical classroom, teaching online can take more time and be more complex for the instructor. That's a fact, it can be. Uh, when done well and thoughtfully, online or alternative methods of delivery can be extremely effective for students that buy into the process. And there are two sides to every story. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. And if, any, if anybody knows the image that I have on this slide, bonus points. It's not the matrix. <laughs> All right. So um, as I mentioned, you know, different modes of learning really do work for different learners. So you have students that are inevitably going to be, you know, tech savvy. They're going to be jumping in. They're going to enjoy the tech. They're going to enjoy being on the computer. Um, then you're going to have the other side of that where there are students who just, you know, don't really love it as much and they struggle to work through the tech and, and those ideas. And that's like a base understanding of the two, the two sides. But there's also, we can look at categories like a visual learner, oral, verbal, physical, logical, social, and solitary. And I think what's really important is we have to find ways to work with those individual types of learners for every single kind of in student that we have in our classes, it might not be the same. So just a couple examples. If we start to look at a student who maybe is a little bit more of a visual learner, you know, what types of media or what types of elements could we use or implement in our class to help that student? So just a, a couple examples here. So for visual, video, animation, image, you know, we look at oral, you know, uh, audio recording, one-to-one -one Zoom meetings, something that I think we've all kind of uh, had a lot of experience with is, is the Zoom um, method of, of, of course delivery. And I think uh, one of the things that we can, we can easily do is look at that one-to-one -one kind of interaction and see how we can, we can benefit by, by utilizing Zoom as something like a one-to-one, -one, which, is, which is very possible. It doesn't have to just be a group. Um, again, verbal, the one-to-one -one Zoom meeting, voice recordings, breakout room, um, and breakout room discussions. Physical can be really challenging. I wanted to uh, give a, a specific example of this. So I teach a lot of video production courses, um, which require a uh, physicality of having a camera or having lights or having an audio recording device. And one of the things that I found was really challenging at times was students who couldn't actually get the get the machinery or get the the tech they needed. They couldn't go and pick up a camera. So what we had to do was find ways to make that physicality work across the board. So we would look at things like, hey, you know what? Maybe we can use a cell phone to record video for this particular project because the learning outcomes are really about composition and blocking of a scene. So we don't necessarily need to have them interchange a lens or use a specific camera for this particular function. So we can find ways to work around the limitations of the physicality, um, which I think is, is very beneficial across the board. Um, and it does happen in, in other, uh, uh, other types of classes as well. 
Um, but for, for me specifically, having to give cam uh, cameras to students was a challenge. So we had to find ways around that. Um, again, looking at different types of learners here, social. You know, we have students that want to be social. We have students that want to kind of have that that one to one kind of or or have that group discussion. Um, so there's ways to do that through Zoom breakouts, discussion boards, uh, Discord, Miro boards, uh, synchronous course meetings, and group projects with interactions. But then on the other side of that, if we look at a solitary student, maybe we can look at that and find ways for them to work asynchronously using things like Miro boards or discussion boards that don't need that direct. Um, you know, one to one or uh, uh, immediate connection. And then again, uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom meetings one to one and then asynchronous project briefs that allow students to work um, uh, outside of a direct in class or uh, synchronous uh, mode. And there's multiple uh, learning styles that uh, kind of cross that platform, screen recordings, screen sharing and screen control through Zoom, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. And then there's uh, lots of other alternative methods for project um, material delivery um, and adjusting outcomes, as I mentioned. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, students need that simplicity and consistency. So one of the things I kind of learned this the hard way, and I think a lot of us maybe are familiar with this as well, when we first started teaching, you know, fully online, we tried to overcompensate at times and provide way too much information. And I think what I learned kind of the hard way was students were getting a little lost and saying, hey, Dave, where's all the stuff? You know, how do I how do I track like what you're trying to tell me? And I realized that it really does take organization on my part. It also takes a simplification of how I'm delivering the materials. So what I was looking at was ways to simplify the information that I was putting out. So I started to really, you know, organize, label, help students understand, you know, hey, this is the class period that we're, you know, this is the demo that we have. And here are the specific demos. I also limited my recording time for my demos to less than 15 minutes, because anything over that is a challenge for students to sit down and watch. So keeping those really concise and trying to be as, as, as concise as possible with my screen recordings really did help. Um, so again, you know, I, I started to create uh, YouTube playlists as well because it kept everything organized. So not only were the students able to access um, by individual links that I was posting, but I also made a playlist for them that they could then take that link and have it after the course was done. And it encompassed everything that that course taught just in a playlist format so they could go through and watch it. So, and it goes from the very beginning of the class to the end of the class. So that was really helpful for a lot of students. I still get students who email me and say, I'm still watching that playlist. So that's really awesome. So I also really feel that students are gonna gravitate to what they know and what they use. So I like to make this comparison. You know, how many of us are still writing letters? I mean, some of us might be, but probably not a lot. How many of us are still making phone calls? Um, my wife will not make a phone call. You know, she doesn't use, she doesn't talk on the phone, which I think is crazy, but she just doesn't use it. Um, how many of us are still texting, which I think is kind of funny because that's starting to drop off. How many of us are still using Facebook, right? So I think like as we go and technology changes, we adapt and we start to use certain things and we're going to use what we're familiar with as the students will. And I think um, it's something that we need to be aware of. And just keeping up to the idea of what students are using and why they're using it is really important. So just a couple examples. So Discord, our students, especially in entertainment arts, are using Discord nonstop. Students stay connected to Discord constantly. It's on app and computer. It's a, a messaging tool that allows you to post images, allows you to post video, um, but students use it. And it's really a great way to get in touch with people. Instagram, images, videos, art, lifestyle, trends, entertainment. YouTube, videos, tutorials, entertainment, really everything. I, I use YouTube pretty heavily. I think it's one of those tools that um, we all know it, we all use it, but it's one of those things that as we're going through the process, YouTube can be really valuable um, if we're using it the right way. TikTok. Breaking news, bite-size info. The bite-size info is really important for me. Uh, I tend to be long-winded when I'm doing demos, so I really have to keep that concise. And I look at those models of things that are presented quickly in short little bursts because it does help students retain that information. Um, Pinterest, 
used really heavily for bookmarking, inspiration, pulling images. I actually assign Pinterest as a, as a tool in some of my courses uh, as a way to build uh, mood boards. Uh, it's really valuable. Snapchat and again, uh, texts. So there's a lot of tools out there that can really help with uh, the way that we're presenting information and building courses. Um, again, if we look at what the trends are, what students are using in their personal life, there's ways to kind of integrate some of what they do within other tools. So for example, we have Miro. I'm gonna talk about these kind of uh, briefly, but um, we use, we've used it at faculty assembly. Um, you know, it's a great way to have collaboration. Um, it's a, it's something that students can add information quickly. Uh, it's a whiteboard tool that allows students to post notes and, and also do, you know, quick um, informational um, dumps uh, while still being connected to each other uh, in a one to one basis. But it doesn't have to be one to one. It doesn't have to be synchronous. It can also be asynchronous where you're just leaving information and people can log in and check it out and comment. So Miro is a great tool for things like that. Um, Google Drive. I use Google Drive constantly. And uh, um, you know, I think one of the great things and sometimes one of the most overlooked elements of Google Drive is that it's not just a file storage tool, but there's also a million ways to leave feedback. Um, you know, specifically if I'm creating some art or working on a, a you know, specific video uh, project with students, I can have them upload their videos and I can literally go into their rough cuts and leave feedback as comments in their video. They can then access that video and see all those comments. And I think it's a great way, again, to leave that, you know, maybe it's not the final, I'm not grading through Google Drive or anything like that. Um, I'm literally just using it as a feedback tool, which is really, really valuable. Um, it is obviously file storage. Uh, there's a ton of uh, a ton of opportunity there for file storage and uploading uh, uploading files uh, for classes. And then lastly, collaboration. I think Google Drive. It, I, we all use it, right? We know we know what it can do. It's an amazing tool. Google Drive for collaboration is huge. Uh, so students students will just gravitate towards it because it's easy and they have access to it, and it's a it's a pretty simplistic way to to use that tool. Canvas. Um, obviously, I hope this one isn't overlooked by the our us here at CCS because we use Canvas as our LMS. There are a lot of ways to leverage Canvas. Um, you know, for example, um, creating parent courses um, that can be um, shared to the Commons that can then also just be dumped over to the next semester. Conference tools inside of Canvas. So think Zoom, but it's an internal in Canvas. Uh, modules with prerequisite learning paths. So if you want students to make sure they're following a certain prerequisite course uh, path, you can set that up directly in Canvas. Um, there's multiple modes for quick feedback, um, robust methods for posting media and content. Uh, you know, really there's no shortage of, of ways that we can post content in Canvas. And I think just um, uh, it's, it's a great opportunity there as well. And then lastly, um, uh, the community support within Canvas is huge. Uh, so I just posted a couple examples here. I, I use voice to text. I use screen recording. I use the markup inside of Canvas all through the grading system because those are great ways. So the voice to text, if you're not using it, is an amazing way to quickly put in your information and then uh, you know get students uh, robust feedback. Uh, screen sharing is huge. So I use Screencast-O-Matic. It's free, um, but there's also OBS, which is also free. It's a way to screen record. Screencast-O-Matic is great if you want to just quickly upload to YouTube. It has a button that literally you just do your screen recording and then upload it to YouTube directly. Zoom. We know Zoom. We all use Zoom. It's really outstanding. Um, it's, it's a great method, but there's other things that you can do in there, such as screen recording. You can set up a Zoom meeting for students to access and then record their own uh, presentations if need be. So uh, students who maybe are trying to, um, you know, need to present for something can actually go in and um, use a, a screen recording through Zoom and uh, post that for you to share. Um, YouTube, as I mentioned before, um, set up via the CCS email account, record directly on screen uh, or record with another program. You can make private or unlisted recordings. So you don't have to share that with the world. You can just share with specific people. And then lastly, there's uh, um, you can provide info in descriptions on the YouTube 
uh, videos themselves. It is limited to 500 characters, but uh, that's actually quite a bit of information. Flipgrid is great as well. It's that bite size. Think TikTok. It's short little video recordings. People can go in, record videos with their phones, um, and then post and share those videos back and forth as a way to provide information and a quick collab. This could be asynchronous. Slack and Discord, as I mentioned, um, there's no shortage of students using Discord. Um, Slack is another great tool to create a, uh, a method of one-to-one -one communication. Um, and again, you can kind of create with Discord, you can create um, servers and, and, and specific um, outlets for individual courses, which is a great way to proceed with that. Um, Second Life, see if this video will play. I don't think it's gonna load. Sorry about that, gang. Um, Second Life, if you haven't used that, is a, oh, there we go, there's the video. Um, Second Life is a tool that allows for virtual environment creation. It's still kicking, it's still around. In 2008, when I first started doing distance learning stuff, this was one of the tools that we were investigating and seeing if it would be valuable. Um, Second Life is utilized in the educational world quite frequently uh, to create virtual environments for people to access. You can create a space where multiple students can access the space at one time, collaborate within the space. You can create unique environments to explore, have students explore and see um, almost, you know, in reality, it's virtual reality, but you can almost see what a space might look like. Um, Fortnite Creative is sort of an extension or a modernization of this tool. Fortnite Creative is available um, within the Fortnite game through Epic, if you haven't played that. But uh, Fortnite Creative is a mode within Fortnite that allows you to build out environments and worlds and then collaborate with up to six people inside that space. It's a great great way to look at um, architectural design, uh, you know, just, you know, uh, any any type of design that you might want to kind of like build into this world or the space you can jump in and create and then lastly here ar and vr so again thinking of ways to kind of like take this into the into the next generation if you want to you know send somebody some information or send somebody a 3d model and then they can look at that and say what is this going to look like in a physical space ar right like have them load the app on their phone put the model in there they can actually look around with their phone and see what that space might look like taking the need for having them to be physically in a space on campus away because now they're able to utilize this ar technology in a new and novel way to see what those environments might look like and then VR is another great tool. So there's some awesome tools um, specifically within Gravity Sketch, which I'm going to talk about because I have some experience with that. Gravity Sketch is a tool for a, uh, for uh, virtual reality modeling and sculpting, but they have a collab tool which allows multiple people to access Gravity Sketch in one location. So they're actually in one virtual location sculpting and working on the same model at the same time. So it's a great design and uh, collaboration tool there as well. And then teaching online can take more time and be more complex for instructors, but it really is something that as we're moving forward, we can find ways to make that more, uh, more valuable. Oops, let me go back one. Um, so for example, grading with digital rubrics, sharing courses to commons, sharing content between multiple courses, file storage between semesters, communication can actually be easier for online because there's a lot more options. Uh, more robust interactions, um, because we're not face to face, we can have multiple methods here. Um, and it's not tied to a physical location. So if you're teaching online, go ahead and take a vacation, you know, and as long as you got the internet, you're you're totally able to, to fulfill your needs. Um, and again, when done well and done thoughtfully, it's a great way to get students to buy in uh, to the process. Um, but I think one of the biggest things here is being flexible. We have to listen to the feedback from learners. And we have to be a, uh, able to ad adapt uh, to new opportunities as, as they, they come about. Um, and with that, I'm going to leave it on this slide. There's two stories. There's two sides to every story. You're going to have students that love it. And you're going to have students that struggle. And I think finding that balance and finding ways to help not only the students that are, are excelling in online, but also the students that are struggling a little bit, that's going to be the, the way that we're able to build um, success within our online courses and really, really trying to find ways to implement where the students are, kind of meet them where they're at is really, really important. So I'm going to leave it there. I think I went a couple minutes over, but uh, 
stop my share. Thank you so much, David. That was very illuminating. Next Thank you. up, we're going to hear from Ashley. So hi, everyone. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. I know everyone is terrifically busy right now. I'm hoping that you can see my screen. OK. Yes. OK, terrific. So again, I'm Ashley Watson. I know most of you. Um, I'm going to do my best to follow up after that terrific presentation from Dave. Um, I'm going to be kind of taking it a step back and talking about why online learning is important based on industry research and that and the relation of that re um, research to CCS. Like Dave, I'm going to talk about the varied learning styles and where digital instruction can benefit those varied learning styles. And I'm also going to be talking about how to build community in online coursework, because that's always the biggest concern, right? How do you still have that social and peer-to-peer -peer interaction? So we'll start with the industry research. This is from the 2022 CHLOE annual report, and CHLOE stands for the Changing Landscape of Online Education. This is sort of where people go in the U.S. to look for online education stats year after year. So as we're looking at this, know that in this report, which just came out in August, it was determined by the people who responded that by 2025, um, Hybrid education, meaning some delivery that's online, some on campus, is going to be the norm. That's 2025. That's only three years from now. If we look at the chart on the left, we can see that traditional age students, so those are 17 to about 21, 22, uh, they prefer to some extent coming on campus. However, graduate students and adult students or non-traditional students really prefer online education. That's important to us because as you all may be aware, CCS is going after a different demographic. Given the demographic cliff, less high school seniors graduating, we are looking to um, get some of those non-traditional learners, some of those adult learners. And what they're looking for is ease of access. And that means more online. If you look at the chart on the right, you see that this is the anticipated growth in online student interest going up to 2025. Uh, come on, there we go. And none of this is really surprising because in 2021, we learned that 82% of college presidents were saying that they were going to up their online offerings in the hope of getting these adult learners. So what does this look like? So we all know about MOOCs and open education resources. Um, this is the Udemy, the Coursera. It's a wide open field of vendors right now. But the important thing to know for our needs is they're offering free and low cost credentials. And it used to just be certificates. Now it's actually degrees, low cost degrees. Typically, the delivery mode is asynchronous, meaning that the faculty work is done up front. They design the course, and then it goes out to students in an asynchronous way, and then faculty involvement after that is looking at the assessments as they come in. Moving on to competency-based education, we could do an entire piece just on competency-based education, and we probably should, but um, for our purposes today, just understand that this is seen as something that in the next five years is just going to grow at colleges and universities throughout the United States. Um, there was a 76% of all colleges and universities believe it would grow. Now, as you can see in this one graphic, it allows for scaling because, again, competency-based education is typically online, typically asynchronous. Um, so you can really scale, which means revenue generation. And for all of these higher education institutions that are currently in a bit of a bind, this is looking to be more and more like a, a possible answer. So that's important to think about. Adaptive learning technology. So you're probably really familiar with these. Adaptive learning is when you are um, you're on an interface and there's an AI 
behind the interface that is watching how you move through it. It's watching your reading speed. It's watching what questions you get right and which ones you get wrong, where you have particular areas of challenge. And then it turns around and provides a individualized learner centric profile for you where it's teaching you exactly what you individually need to know, not just the whole class. As you can see, it's projected to grow by 22.7% by 2025. And this is because of AI and all of the uses that we're seeing more and more. So how does this work with CCS? Um, right now, fall 2022, if we do not count internships, independent studies, anything in continuing um, studies and FYE courses, we have 14.3% of our credit bearing courses that are available hybrid or online. We are so behind the eight ball. This number in my mind should be up by the fifties. And I know that's really hard to do when we're in art and design school. So let's talk about some ways that we can provide this content in a meaningful way that will allow for knowledge integration synthesis. So, Dave talked about uh, learner modalities. Same thing here. The important thing to understand from this slide and all of these categories people argue about all the time, so just think of this as an approximation, is that none of us are single mode learners, meaning that we are all multimodal to some extent, some people more than others. This becomes very important, especially when we're talking about the neurodiverse population and we're getting more and more of students who are um, who, who announce themselves, I can't remember the name, of um, calling themselves neurodiverse, right? So multimodal learning is super important. And that means that when you are delivering content, you're delivering it in various ways. So um, and maybe you're showing them a visual at the same time you have a voiceover talking to get to the auditory. In the same time, you're, um, you're asking them to perform something with their own hands. So it's experiential. And so that's more tactile, et cetera. So that's the multimodal. That's becoming, again, really important. And the reason why it's important is because the whole reason we're doing all of this is knowledge integration. So it's one thing to have somebody talk at you and to put it in your short-term memory and to be able to answer it, um, some questions on a quiz and then have it all go away by the time the class ends. We've all experienced that. What we want um, is to have this knowledge be integrated and synthesized into a worldview, into a knowledge base for students. And in order for that to happen, we need to give them that information in various ways. Again, multimodal. So knowledge integration, super important. So um, Assistant Dean Amy Roop, she looked at a draft version of this presentation and came back with this quote, which is so terrific because it's something I hadn't thought of before. As we're talking about this, I keep saying delivery method, how faculty deliver content. If you look at the bottom of the quote, she's also talking about how students deliver their submissions back to faculty, right? So it's not only that we have to be more adaptive and flexible with how we're presenting information, but how we're taking in the information from students, because depending on the students, something's going to make more sense to them given their own learning modality. So these are different modalities. There's a lot of them. These are some real basic ones that show up often in literature over and over as being something that can be done online well. So this one, you know, this is your technical skill demonstration. Dave spoke about this a lot in his. It's a mainstay of art and design. Um, how do you do this if it's a fully online course? You record yourself. Um, what the challenge has been having students have the tools, the space needs, all of the, the equipment to repeat what you have demonstrated. And that, of course, depends on the discipline. What some programs have done, like Fashion, Aki, he sent them kits. So sent via post to their house kits to use, and then they created what they needed to using those materials. Other faculty have asked that students create using really easily accessible and inexpensive materials, sometimes household items. So this is really a creative challenge for faculty. 
um, to help students work through preliminary exercises with tools and equipment that's immediately available. Concept demonstration, um, that's trickier, right? Like how do you demonstrate a concept in a multimodal way and ensure that it's integrated um, in the student? Like how, how can they synthesize that? So now we have graphs, we have charts, we have images. Um, the provision of case studies is something that kept coming up in literature as I was doing this research. So that's really interesting. Um, and role-playing to work through some of the ideas that's also going to help with your cooperation and coordination. And again, we're gonna talk about community building in a second, but one other thing to point out is as you see on this slide, if you are looking to aid in retention and engagement with the student, making the concepts personalized whenever possible to the student is gonna be super helpful and it will engender more discussion, et cetera. Experiential learning. Now we've heard a lot about this. We talk about this all the time. These are sponsored projects and our internships, but it's not just that. And this is possible in online course delivery. It is. You, um, what I've seen in literature is you could ask students to go out and interview people and make use of their observational and interaction skills. Again, we have the role playing as a possibility, uh, individual field trip to an event or a local venue, that type of thing. And the reason why experiential learning allows for such great integration and synthesis is because there's agency on the part of the learner. This is someone having to go out and do something and experience something themselves. And it's really terrific also because it gives them something to talk about with one another. They may not have had the same experience, but they had consistent similar experiences completing the assignment that we can discuss. Active learning. So active learning is a huge buzzword right now in um, education. You may have heard of it in terms of flipped classrooms. Ian brought that to my attention. So flipped classrooms, this is what people are talking about. Specifically, if you look on the left-hand side, this is from the University of Minnesota, maybe. Um, and it's really interesting. Let me start from the beginning. So active learning is basically you send all your materials to the students prior to their class time. So if I want students to listen to me lecture and to read three things and to, you know, independently answer two questions before the discussion begins, I send all of that to them before class. They're expected to do it all before class. Then the entirety of the class, the entirety of the time that you are together with the student is spent in active learning, which takes the form of any of these examples offered on that line from simple to complex. The reason for this is, again, that integration and synthesis of knowledge and that multimodal intake in terms of delivery. Now, there are some colleges where this is what they are requiring for all classes, 100% active learning, meaning if, if it's an on-campus course, they still have to go online, get all this stuff, look at it before they come to class on the on-campus course. It's a really interesting concept. We're nowhere near there, but it's something to think about. If you look at the, um, the pyramid on the right, again, people can test the accuracy, but if you look at it as an approximation, of how we integrate knowledge, it's pretty good. And, you know, listening to a lecture is right up at the top, but, you know, as you go down through, you start seeing um, better integration. So other methods, and um, Dave talked about some of these uh, gamification, screen gestures, visually compelling colors and imagery, cadence spoken narration with transcripts. It's not enough to just provide the narration. You also want to provide a written copy of it for those who are readers. Background music is often offered as um, a, an important aspect, especially with technical demonstration videos. And then different stories for different concepts. You don't want to go through an entire course of study and use the same story that you're just following along because some stories are going to impact some people better than others. Part three, 
we're going into building community. How do you build community in an online course? So um, this is super important given the feelings of isolation so many students are feeling right now, mental health issues. Melanie McClintock, who is our chair of uh, color and material design and graduate, she asked this question at a presentation given last spring. And it's such a good question. How do you do this? And as you can see, this is from Barnes and Noble. They have a um, division that's dedicated to research. And as you can see, students are really concerned about the lack of social interactions in online courses as well. So what can we do? Creating psychological safety in the classroom is step one. Um, on the left, we have something from McKinsey that's talking about the need for leadership. In this case, it would be the faculty being consultative and supportive as opposed to authoritarian. We can also talk about creating classroom charters. And what that is, is it's something that is uh, first thing, you know, students come in and they learn, they, they're given this document, either online or in class. And the charter specifically states that this is what is the norm and expectations within this class. And basically that charter could be created following this yes column. We'll talk a little bit more about charters as we go through these slides so you'll see what I'm talking about. Discussion boards, these get a really bad rap, um, but they're super terrific in some ways, especially for the shy student or somebody who stutters or speaks slowly or takes time to gather their thoughts. Um, it, it has all of these benefits you see listed here, but it also um, requires a lot of the faculty at its initiation, at its launch, right? Faculty have to be prompting people, be asking questions to get people to go deeper. Um, you know, trying to engender more discussion in the discussion board. And so, you know, there's a trade-off in terms of effort. Team projects. Team projects are great, um, according to the literature, for building the sense of community within a classroom. And so this is an example of what a template for a team charter could look like. You always want teams to be small rather than large, so three to five individuals, and that ensures that everyone participates. And when you have this team charter, it really, again, lays out the norms and expectations and everyone is now accountable. And then this would, of course, go to the faculty um, before the initiation of the actual project itself, so the faculty can ensure there's an equitable distribution of who's doing what work, it's signed by everyone, et cetera. Experiential experiences. So we talked about these earlier. Again, agency is the most important part of this, but when we're talking about how experiential experiences improve a sense of community, it's that consistency of a shared experience um, that people can come back and talk about on discussion boards or in whatever way. So experiential experiences, um, really help with both learner synthesis and a retention of concepts, as well as a commonality with peers based on an experience. Learning community development is what all of this is about, right? So um, I am going to read a quote because I think it's a really good one. You know what? I think I skipped a slide. No, I didn't. Learning community development. So. Learning community development studies suggest that students in learning communities tend to collaborate better, exude more academic effort, and achieve full academic integration. So that's what we're trying to do with these online courses. Integration support. So this is a lot, and Dave threw a lot at you. I'm throwing some stuff at you just from the literature that's out there. And um, you might be wondering, how am I going to integrate this into the class? And like Dave, I wanna give a shout out to the educational technology and innovation team. Um, they're a small team right now. Hopefully they will grow soon. And they can help with integrating some of these facets into your course. And finally, why are we doing this? It's really important to talk about this because a lot of questions arise when we try to reinvent the wheel of something that has been working super well for many, many years. 
And we have faculty who are terrific in their in-class pedagogy. There's never been a question about that. So the question might be, why are we even attempting to move online or considering it? Shouldn't we be more a hands-on institution, et cetera? And by way of answering that to just a little bit of an extent, I offer this grid and this grid is, it tells you a lot about what the future of higher education is going to look like. We came upon it when we were doing research for competencies and skills um, and how those uh, work with learning outcomes and are repeated by learning outcomes. So, but if you look at where we're at now, we're somewhere between one and two in all of these as a society. This is what's coming. And as an institution, to continue to be successful, we need to be closing in on three. And we need to be doing that pretty darn soon. And we're not there yet. So we need to keep working at it. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time again. Thank you so much, Ashley. That was also very informative. Um, at this point in time, I would like to open it up to questions or discussion. Um, from members of the audience. Um, there were a couple of things that I wanted to point out that came up in the chat. Um, Dave shared a, a link to some tutorials for Canvas um, and Gretchen asked that if anybody is um, experiencing issues with Canvas or they'd like help with some instructional aspects to submit uh, a ticket for educational technology. So are there any, any questions? Okay, um, so I actually, I have a question that I was wondering um, for both of you. And um, that is in an ideal world where anything is possible, what would you like to see CCS do to stay ahead of the curve for higher education? Do you, do you want to go, Ashley? I'll go. Um, you know, I think <clears throat> I think from from my standpoint, um, what we're starting to see with the support of you know uh, departments like EdTech and just just in talking with you know Ian and Tim uh, and leadership about what they see coming down the the pipe as far as like where we want to take things. There's a lot of really exciting opportunities uh, for distance and, and online learning. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's going to be, like I said, there's going to be two sides to the story. And I think that that's kind of where, uh, from my vantage point, I see where we can provide support for the instructors who really want to jump in and look at how they can implement that online learning. Um, maybe, uh, you know, that, that transition of their face-to-face -face courses to the online courses, um, supporting the instructors that really want to find that, um, that place to live. Um, but also for the instructors that are maybe not, you know, not a hundred percent there yet, or they, they don't want to jump into that realm, finding ways to help support them with the technologies as well. So that doesn't feel like, everybody has to be at the same level for online education right away because i think that it can it can be a it can be a really scary moment for somebody if they don't see how it can be beneficial yet and they're being forced to do something where it's like oh, I, I don't know if i'm there yet but if we can really start to implement and roll in the examples of the online courses that are really successful we can showcase and show how that can be how that can be um effective um, and, I, and just as an example from our department, from Entertainment Arts, we have uh, we have courses that are being run online, um, specifically within our concept design emphasis. Those courses are being run online remotely, um, and I think that's a great example of ways that we can kind of implement um, that online uh, those online courses because it's it's now pulling in faculty from all over the country, and it's providing a really robust. Um, educational opportunity for students. 
Um, and we started to see ways that some of our 3D animation courses can be run online because really it's really heavily software based. So if a student has a computer and has access to the internet, um, they can get access to the software. There's not as much physicality beside the computer. Uh, so there's ways and 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 I think EA has a has a pretty um, I don't want to say easy way in, but if a student has a computer and is running software that they're going to use for their courses anyway, they're already going to be able to sort of make that jump over to an online course in a lot of situations. So uh, it's kind of a long roundabout way of saying support the people that are jumping on and latching on, and then also provide that second level support for student for for faculty and students who who need that little bit of push and, and help. So Amy, can you repeat the question for me? Sure. Um, so it's just basically if you could do anything and anything was possible, what would you like to see CCS do to stay ahead of the curve? Right. So I agree with everything Dave just said about the online um, incorporation and support and encouragement. But I feel like it's more than that. If I had my druthers um, and we could do whatever we wanted to do, we would be doing much more environmental scanning, both in the US and internationally to see what these innovative learning modalities are. We would be looking at how we can make learning more affordable. Um, one of the, the worst impacts of higher ed is it's just deepening inequality in some ways. And that's, um, we don't want to be responsible for that, right? That's not what we're supposed to be doing. And so thinking about different funding structures, thinking about how we can be more accessible to the greatest amount of people. And then at the same time, thinking about how we can continue to generate revenue as an institution so that we can, can stay afloat without charging exorbitant tuitions. I think those three things are super important. And online education is a portion of that, but it's certainly not the only thing. We need to be willing to, um, look at all of these options and try them. And if they don't work, stop trying them and then try the next one. And we just really need to put the students and their experience in the center um, with the ethical value of making sure that they are not in debt for however many years, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Um, ben Rosales put in the chat, does CCS perceive the option of full-time remote faculty? I'm not sure if either of you can speak to that. That's a Tim, Ian, or Nadine question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. We, um, the, uh, ben, possibly just depending on um, how quickly we pivot and what that full-time faculty member is teaching as a whole. Um, so there's a, there's a possibility there. We have um, we have a lot of faculty teaching remotely, as David mentioned, as adjuncts, and um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna evaluate as we go. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, I don't, I don't wanna hog the floor if anybody else has questions, but I am curious um, about how you learn about and test cutting edge teaching and learning technologies. How do you find out about them? How do you, how do you get some hands-on experience with them? I'll start with this one because this is what I do. Um, you just, you know, I think I think the biggest thing for me is trying it. You know, um, how do you test it? I go into that little sandbox that we got in Canvas and I try everything. You know, I'll post something and I'll see if it works, and then I'll go into the student view and I'll see if it is, you know, going to show up correctly for the student. So I mean, like that's that's like a that's like a surface level testing. But um, quite honestly, you know, I mentioned YouTube. 
I, I'm a YouTuber. Um, I use YouTube all the time. I Google everything. I am constantly like asking questions of people like, um, you know, and it can be sort of hard if you don't know the people who are doing the distance education or distance learning courses, but even people who aren't, you know, I have, I have faculty in, in the department that started using discord a while back. And I'm like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to jump into discord. I don't know if I love it. And then all of a sudden I started looking at it. I'm like, well, what are the benefits? Like how, how does it affect, you know, your, your way of like communicating or teaching? And I started to see the, the positives of it. So now I, I'm, I'm converting to discord. So I think, I think one of the things is like constantly being able to kind of stay up with technology and see what is being used is huge. And it's not always going to be just the teaching environment. I think a huge part of this is like the technology environment outside of the educational, you know, world, you know, what's, what's out there? Like, what are people doing? Um, you know, and I think that for me, just, you know, and part of the nature of what I do anyway, um, I have to constantly stay up to date with software, um, you know, what I do professionally and, and from an instructional standpoint. So I'm constantly looking at those, those different tools. Um, you know, I, yeah, I go, I, I guess from like another surface level, like I'm always reading, you know, different tech articles, um, like what, oh, Hey, look what they're doing with AR. That's pretty awesome. Could that be integrated into a teaching environment or, you know, Hey, look, you know, there's a cool app that you can get on your phone that allows you to, you know, quickly record a video and then like, you know, inscribe something on it with your finger right on the, on the screen. How could I use that for teaching? You know? So like, um, you know, I teach a game class, a game uh, entry level game design class, and it'd be amazing to take a photo on my phone and, and write a little note and then directly post it to canvas to say, take a look at this tree. Wouldn't that be amazing modeled in your, in your space? You know, things like that. I think it's just a matter of like staying aware and staying open to those opportunities. I would agree. And, you know, Kristen just put in the um, in the chat the importance of looking at industry information that comes out, right? There are so many industry newsletters that come out. And we're trying in academic affairs to sort of collate some, some important bits and put them in the weekly newsletter. So it's a little bit easier for people to stay up to date on what's going on in higher ed. Um, and that includes technological innovation. So um, I agree with what Dave said. I would say read everything that you possibly can. Attend as many of these webinars and, and just um, your basic development opportunities that are available through these in industry sources, but also joining the associations. It's amazing the conversations that you end up having with people who are in similar positions as your own and what they're dealing with in their institutions and how it, um, you know, it does, it funnels through every institution and, and you get so many great ideas. So talking to people outside of the college is I think huge. I think that we have an enormous knowledge base here, but we become very insular, insular and we really need to um, talk to people outside of what we're doing. And Amy, I also wanted to add to that, that we have, you know, our ed tech team and, and hopefully we'll be hiring a director of educational technology and innovation soon. Um, and that that person should be an advocate for new technologies. And that should be a place where faculty can go and experiment and play and try new technologies and see if it will work for the college. So we're trying to get that um, reestablished as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, I did just want to note that Ian was following up in the chat um, to Ben's question about remote faculty. And uh, Ian said that the recent advertisements for new adjunct faculty allow for fully remote from anywhere in the United States. So um, do we have any other quick questions? We've got about a minute and a half, so. Um... Okay. Um, well, it is 1229, so I um, would like to ex extend an invitation to everybody to the October um, Faculty Professional Development Lecture Series talk, which is exemplary classes at CCS with Aki Chocolate and Russell Jones, and that's being held Friday, October 28th at 1130 a.m., same link, so we'll hope to see you all there. And in the meantime, thank you so much, Ashley and David, for a very illuminating talk.